Chapter Sixteen of Claude Lightfoot, or How the Problem Was Solved, by Father Francis Finn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen, in which Claude takes to poetry. About ten days after their arrival at their camping grounds on Lake Vesper, John Winter remarked to Frank, "Haven't you noticed that Pearson and Dockery avoid one another of late? Now that you speak of it." said frank it strikes me that there is some sort of coolness between them and another thing archer doesn't come near our fellows any more what do you think is the matter john i can't say it's worth looking into claude called frank looking up toward the sky well exclaimed claude from the outer end of a branch twenty-five feet above their heads say you'll break your neck if that branch gives way come down i want to talk with you i'm not going to break my neck frank i'm learning a new way of getting off a tree before frank could interpose claude catching hold of the very tip of the branch swung himself off the branch bent beneath his weight and brought him several feet nearer ground then claude swinging in the air cast his eyes about he quickly found what he wanted for with a slight spring he let go his hold and caught in his descent the branch of another tree there was a sharp crackling sound the branch snapped and claude came tumbling to the ground dodging by a miracle it would appear the weight and force of the broken branch john and frank looked on in speechless amazement it didn't work as well as i thought it would said claude in a matter-of-fact way but it was worth trying i'm sorry about my pants though there's a tear at the knees again it isn't such a very big one frank added claude deprecatingly pants bawled frank it's always pants don't you know sir that there's such a thing as the tearing of limbs that pants are a drug in the market but that limbs lost cannot be supplied but a bold peasantry their country's pride when once destroyed can never be supplied answered claude catching at the last words of his indignant guardian that fellow is possessed exclaimed john winter after escaping with his life he gets up and soliloquizes on the state of his breeches and tops that off with a quotation from the deserted village small boys continued this young gentleman of beardless sixteen weren't quite that bad nor that learned either when i was one of them frank paying no heed to these severe reflections on times and manners was busily brushing claude while that young harum scarum made a playful feint at tickling his guardian goodness continued john gazing at the two if an angel from heaven were to come down and assure that young innocent that by rights he ought to have a broken leg the boy would laugh and turn the subject off to wings or anything and wouldn't be in the least impressed well said frank when he had brought the madcap to a respectable appearance i suppose it's no use scolding you what for frank for the risk you ran booby why how did i know that that old branch was rotten i didn't run any risk the branch should not have broken yes said john gravely the branch ran the risk and now it's done for now claude continued frank dismissing this last adventure with a little grimace and a gesture of hopelessness we're going out for a row in the sunset and we want you to come along may i row asked claude eagerly yes if you behave properly walking a short distance through the grove and across an open field they came upon the near shore of lake vesper proper and jumped into a boat which was at frank's disposal taking the tiller ropes elmwood placed claude at the stern oars while winter keeping stroke with claude sat near the prow now began frank i want to know claude what's the matter with dockery and pearson claude laughed <laughs> there's something standing between them he answered hold on 
cried winter dropping his oars to pull out a memorandum book and a pencil just give me a minute to get down that expression it's new to me claude nothing disconcerted rested his oars while frank went on what's er standing between them they're singers said claude i knew that before you came to college and continued the bow oarsman as he endeavoured to feather they each sang a solo at the last exhibition all these things are perfectly new to us exclaimed winter claude had opened his mouth to add further explanations when his crude attempt at feathering brought him head first into young winter's stomach his little legs flying about like those of a turtle when it is thrown upon its back then recovering himself with frank's aid he went on with his story and received no further interruptions from john who gasped and puffed for breath as he pulled away at his oars well the trouble is all about their solo singing pearson came to me pretty blue the other day and said that he'd been told that dockery said he sang with a face on him like a man dying of bellyache and that same evening dockery came and told me how he had heard that pearson had said his voice sounded like a little girl when she sees a rat he was mad well what happened then asked frank nothing they didn't look at each other after that and now when one of them wants to borrow suspenders or collar buttons or anything from the other why they come to me i act as um as uh, go-between said frank there's the milwaukee boy all over exclaimed john just as soon as he gets put out at a friend he avoids him and goes dodging around without one word of explanation it's so foolish and yet i've done it myself half a dozen times you remember frank the time i didn't speak to you for three months i should say so and it was all on account of your not taking any notice of me on the street one day if i'd gone to you like a man and asked for an explanation i could have saved myself from being a fool it was only when you came into class one day with a pair of eyeglasses that i began to see better i began to see better too said frank elmwood with a grin then continued john i asked rob collins what was the matter with you and he told me that you were so near-sighted that you wouldn't notice your own mother on the other side of the street and then frank i felt so mean that i could have sold myself to the lowest bidder but i was just as big a fool as you said frank i knew that you were offended about something and i knew that i had not willingly given you any cause for offence but i was too proud or too babyish to walk up to you like a man and ask you what you were angry about well that taught me a lesson continued john and since then i always act in the manlier fashion of asking an explanation whenever there's any appearance of a misunderstanding there ensued a silence it was very quiet and very beautiful upon the water the sun threw a golden sheen upon the mirror-like face and above the clouds and their courtliest colours floated serene in the dying light this is an hour for poetry frank observed oh that reminds me exclaimed john claude where did you get that quotation you gave the last time you didn't succeed in breaking your neck i learned it by heart i know the traveller too and a lot of goldsmiths what do you read poetry no john i don't think i ever read a dozen lines in my life well how in the world do you know whole poems by heart claude laughed kate has read to me out of lots of poetry books whenever i like a piece i get her to read it several times and then i remember said claude simply do you know any besides goldsmith's poems sure i know the may queen and the charge of the light brigade and we are seven and saint agnes eve and ode on intimations of immortality and all of evangeline 
and the death of the flowers and autumn and drifting and stop stop cried frank john we've got an anthology with us and we didn't know it here claude you take the tiller and i'll row now he added when the change had been effected give us the poem you like best claude threw back his head closed his eyes opened them again and then with a smile began my soul to-day is far away sailing the vesuvian bay my winged boat a bird afloat swims round the purple peaks remote on he went from stanza to stanza this harem scarum throwing his whole soul into the pretty word painting of reed's exquisite poem it is true he failed to bring out the dreaminess and languor of the lines but he infused in lieu of these a radiancy of happiness and a brightness of life and energy which were more congenial to his age and disposition excellent exclaimed frank as the minstrel came to a pause now suppose you give us the may queen as the boat glided slowly past vesper island and rounded it claude in his cheery voice began the poem he was fully equal to the gaiety and prattle of the first part but as he came to the sadder portions his interest flagged and his eyes roved restlessly about among the water-lilies on the eastern side of the island he came finally to the last two verses to lie within the light of god as i lie upon your breast as the wicked cease from troubling and the weary here just within three words of the sublime conclusion claude dropping the tiller reached over and made a snatch at a tempting water-lily there was a splash a movement and the minstrel neither weary nor restful lay floundering in the shallow water still grasping the lily he pulled him in without difficulty and frank uttered some sharp comments well i've got that lily anyhow was the answer there was nothing for it now but to return to camp with all speed to look up more clothes for the poetical madcap End of chapter sixteen